You want to know how to get crazy vascularity? Stay tuned. I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. RxTelevisionRxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Bodybuilding, non-bodybuilding, diet, training, supplementation, whatever is on your mind, this is your forum for the next 30 minutes to get your questions in. Uh, we're going to take questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app, from our Instagram page, and of course, from the Facebook page. Let's go straight into the app questions. Again, these questions First two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app available, uh, Google or iPhone. Who is calling me? All right, I'm going I'm to ignore you. All right. First question. Whenever I incorporate a lot of carbs in a mass diet, it all goes to my stomach and my waist gets huge. I barely get any size anywhere else. Yeah, I think it's a big mistake a lot of people make. I think people just assume that carbs build muscle. And I, and I know this is pretty simplistic, and I know probably for you guys who've watched the show for years, you're like, oh, here we go again. But you know what? A lot of people just don't know. They think that eating carbohydrates, because you get that pumped feel from them, makes you actually get bigger. And, and, and really, all carbs are is a fuel source. And once your gas tank in your car, which is your glycogen stores and your muscles and your liver are filled up, the extra stuff goes to fat storage. So if you're eating a ton of carbs and you don't really need that many carbs, you're not building any more muscle. You're overfilling your glycogen stores and you're storing the rest as fat. And that's why, you know, some people who are very carb sensitive who fill up easily with glycogen, they, if they eat too many carbs, they get fat in the off season. Other people um, like myself will just metabolize the carbs as energy. And so I, I you know, I don't, I, I, it's almost like I can't eat enough of them, but, and I, and I still don't eat excessive amounts of carbs, but you know, I do that for health purposes, but the, the point is you have to know your metabolism. So if you know that if you eat too many carbs, it goes right to your stomach, then you're obviously not eating enough of the right macros, which actually build and repair muscle, which is protein and fat. So look at your diet. Are you eating enough protein five or six times spread out throughout the day in equal increments? Are you eating enough essential fatty acids? You're taking like a product like Omega Lyse for your essential fats. Are you taking in enough monounsaturated fats like macadamia nut oil? extra virgin olive oil, uh, avocados, you know, and, nut, and almonds, stuff like that. Are you taking a, enough saturated fats? We need that too for building muscle. Uh, you know, red meat, uh, whole eggs with the yolks. So a lot of times people don't really have the best diet. They just kind of follow a diet online and it doesn't work for them because just because it worked for Dexter Jackson. So remember, carbs don't build muscle. They're a fuel source. Limit the fuel to what your body needs and make sure you get enough of the right macros that will actually build and repair muscle, which is fat and protein. Second question. Again, these first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Second question, short and simple, GH in when you PCT. When you do post-cycle therapy, okay, uh, following a big cycle when you're doing your Clomid and HCG and all that stuff, can you keep GH in? The question is uh, – the answer is yes because – Growth hormone doesn't affect androgen receptors, okay? They, they work on their own protein receptors on the cell membrane, you know, IGF-1 receptors. So it's not a bad thing. But what I do tell people to do is don't take too much in the off-season. Limit yourself to like two IUs per day. 
So you get the benefits of some fat burning, you get the benefits of repairing your body a little bit, but you're giving your body a break essentially because high, excuse me, high amounts of GH can raise blood pressure. You know, they obviously challenge your body's ability to produce, produce enough insulin. So in the PCT, we're really trying to let the body recover, not stress it out more. So low dose GH, I have no problem with. Now these two questions are from the Dave Palumbo Experience app, which once again, I want to thank you guys for the support. You know, it's $29 a month. You get all my videos, all the articles I've ever written in one place. We have all my protocols, off-season pre-contest, drug cycles, diets, all that stuff. I answer, I do a Q&A video just like we're doing right now. Ask Dave, I do an extra one for the app members every single week. So you get like two. And we put up a workout every week. There's a lot of great information in there. And some people just, you know, want questions answered. And I answer everyone's questions in an open forum. So everyone sees everyone's questions and everyone sees everyone's answers, which is a learning experience. And some people just want to thank me because I answer questions all day long just from people who email me and they just sign up just because they, they want to support the cause. And I appreciate that. And uh, the, the number of members grow every single month. And uh, I, I appreciate that. And that inspires me to want to do more there and uh, keep those questions coming because it's a learning experience for everyone. So those first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Now we go to our Facebook page and Instagram questions. If you're not already following us on Facebook, just go into the search bar type in rx muscle on instagram official underscore rx muscle um rd norm i'm glad he asked this because we've been seeing a rise in uh clinics that offer the hydration iv services and i guess maybe it was rooted in the fitness industry but now it's really uh grown to the common folk and there's so many different offerings out there does doing a rehydration iv two to three times a month is that beneficial this place that i go to um, after a show is offering a monthly membership that is basically the same as a single visit. So your thought um, for bodybuilders and the different phases for a bodybuilder. And then I guess for, I guess, non-bodybuilder. Mm, right. Uh, you know, here's my, my take on this whole thing. To me, that's a luxury service. It's like getting a massage. Will it help? It can't hurt being properly hydrated, getting some vitamins infused into you. Sometimes they do a, they'll do a glutamine, excuse me, a glutathione push. They'll push some glutathione in there. It can only help, okay? However, if you're neglecting other things, like you're not taking a good multivitamin or essential fatty acid supplement or a fiber supplement because you claim, I don't have enough money, but you're spending it on an IV uh, because you think it looks cool that there's a needle going into your arm, you're wasting your money then. If you have expendable income, if you do well and you have extra money and you want to add that on top of all the good modalities you're already doing, I think it's, a, I think it's definitely a worthy investment. But that should not replace the stuff that really actually is, is, is potent. Eating the right foods, you know, taking the right nutritional supplements to support your, what you're doing, getting your sports massage every once in a while you know, to, to make sure that your body's fine-tuned, getting your chiropractic adjustments. If you're doing all that already and, you, and you're like, you know what, I make good money and I can, I can afford it. My friend owns the clinic. He's giving me a deal. Then by all means, do that. But otherwise, it's really a luxury service. And uh, I, I want it I, – I can't – stress that emphatically enough because I think a lot of people uh, prioritize what they do with their money in the wrong way. And if you want to get really good benefits, you know, if you want to get good results, I should say, as a bodybuilder, you have to prioritize in the right way, in the right direction. That means food comes first, supplements, you know, if you're doing PEDs, your PEDs, your gym membership to a good gym where you can train, right? You know, that those are the most important things you can possibly do. And then, of course, sports massage. So once that's taken care of, then you can go to the other thing, but don't skimp. I see guys going to buy a pre-workout and then they're like, I don't have any money to buy anything else. Well, you know what? I think that the, the multivitamin, like the mineralize or the essential fats, like omegalize would be a way better investment than wasting your, your money on a pre-workout that's not doing anything for you other than jacking you out of your mind. Drink coffee if you, if you really want the stimulant effect. But if you have the money to buy all the supplements you need and you want to do the pre-workout, then that's great. So prioritize. That is probably today's key word prioritize if you prioritize correctly you're going to get the best results in your bodybuilding goals well since you just mentioned uh pre-workouts we'll take this question next it's from uh, Syed shah uh since we have pre-workouts to hype us up to work out what was the source of energy back in the 80s and 90s for bodybuilders you really want to know the answer to that sid it's called passion guys <laughs> Wake up, man! i don't need anything to get me to the gym i love going to the gym I don't need to wake up. I'm there. I could be. I could have one hour of sleep. I can go to the gym and train because I love to be there. If you need something to to make you want to work out, then you probably pick the wrong sport to get involved in. 
you should the idea of going to the gym and training aside from the fact that you know maybe if you're dieting and you're and you're on very very low you know you're a week or two out from a show but even then the show should inspire you to want to go to the gym i never had motivation problems going to the gym to be honest with you nothing that a cup of coffee couldn't help me with when i was dieting you know so you know that's what we used back in the day we used coffee and some people, you know, when, when ephedra came about, you know, there was a product called Dimetadrine from AST Research a lot of guys were using in the 90s. Um, I never used it. I, I don't even know why I never tried it. I just, I was never a stimulant guy. I always felt like it was going to raise my cortisol levels too high and, and create too much, you know, breakdown in my body, catabolism. And so I was always anti, you know, against overstimulating the body, you know. If I really needed to wake myself up, you know, because I was dieting real hard, I would drink coffee. And, and that's really that, – that's the God honest truth. I wish I could tell you that I had some crazy concoction. And I know people that love the Fedra. I mean, they lived on that stuff. Uh, but, but what happens is you become dependent on it, and then it doesn't work as well. And then, you, you know, and then if you stop it, you get withdrawal. I, I think that the, the less you take to have to lift yourself up, the better. Bodybuilders do better on stuff that relaxes them because the more you relax – and the more low key you keep your cortisol levels, the better you recover and, and the, the better you grow. So you, you don't, there's no such thing as a, as a crackhead bodybuilder who's big, okay? Just, it just doesn't happen. Most bodybuilders probably smoke weed to calm themselves down. Uh, so try to stay away from the excessive stimulants. Um, Mike Molinaro, do pro, I, and I guess this question would be athlete to athlete, coach to coach. <laughs> Do pros stay on HGH year round? And if so, do they drop the dose down ever? You know, I don't know what all pros do. I know what I do with the guys I work with. I yeah, I have them have a, it's a little higher during the year, and I, if they can afford to stay on it all year round, we, we usually do. Um, when we, as we mentioned earlier, when they're doing their PCT and their off period, I allow them to stay on two IUs a day if they want. Some people want to go completely off and just clean out. So, you know. GH is the kind of thing that the only reason you would go off it is maybe if you're getting a little insulin resistant, meaning that you're, maybe your fasting blood sugar is going up a little too much and you want to give your pancreas a break a little bit. But dropping down to two IUs is probably a, a, you know, a safe amount that's not going to really affect blood sugar levels too much. Um, one of the things, like I said, we didn't do back in my day was check fasting blood sugars in the morning. So if yours are up, especially when you're eating a lot of food in the off season, that's something you can address separately. But I don't think it's uh, – I think to answer your question – I think it's a money thing. If the bodybuilders have the money to use the GH, they're staying on it because it's not going to affect androgen receptors. And that's the only thing we want to restore is the androgen receptivity. And in doing that, we have to come off the anabolics. The, the pro, uh, protein hormones like insulin and, and uh, thyroid and growth hormone are not going to affect your androgen receptors. Let's go to uh, Alan Minch. I know Armin, Armin Adibi, is big on MK677. What should be one's expectations with using 20 mg a day? Uh, first off, you know, any of the growth hormone releasing peptides, you know, MK677 is popular because it's a pill. It's not an injectable, but there is most of the uh, GH releasers um, are in injectable form. CJC, 1295, you know, hexarelin is um, uh, GHRP6, GHRP2. A sermorellin is the one that I, I think is sold by Titan Medical. That's the prescription form of it. So they all respond differently in different people's bodies. And I've, I've addressed this before, but if you t if I take a growth hormone releasing peptide, my pituitary, which is where the growth hormone is produced, is going to be stimulated, and I'm going to release X amount of GH. If Sid takes the same amount, he's going to produce possibly X minus two or X plus two amount of GH, depending on what his pituitary glands capabilities are. So everyone responds to these growth hormone releasing peptides completely differently. So you could talk to someone who got great results on taking MK677 at 20 milligrams a day. And then you could talk to another guy who took it and got nothing from it because his body just didn't respond to it as well. And that's why it's kind of a crapshoot when you use the growth hormone releasing peptides. Taking real GH itself now you don't have to worry about the pituitary releasing the GH. You're actually putting the growth hormone into your body, so it's going to have an effect. And so that's why more people, especially pro bodybuilders and people at the top level, are going to use growth hormone itself because they know the, the, the GH releasing peptides are, are, are variable at best. You know? And so you, know, you just don't know what you're going to get. And uh, you know, if you have the money, the growth hormone is probably the way to go. Let's go to uh, Bodie, Bodie Martin. Uh, best way to relieve and stretch rotator cuffs to improve range and lessen pain. 
you know, it's, a lot of people have troubles stretching themselves. Um, there's, I wish they had one here in Cape Coral, but I know that there's a chain of stretching clinics now where they actually, it's like a franchise and they'll, they'll, you go in there for like an hour session and they stretch you out. <laughs> stretch lab, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah. And yeah, the funny yeah, yeah. Is I, I know people have gone to them. They said they're amazing. And I, I look, I've been stretched before by people that really knew what they were doing. It hurts, but you feel amazing after you. It's like every every little creak and, and pain you have goes away. It's really, really amazing. I, I, I hope that they spread them all over the place because it's a great thing to do. So can you stretch your own rotator cuff? Sure. You know, you can hang. You can. You can, you know, hold on to something and kind of twist the other way. This is all, you can do all the different stretches we see people doing in the gym. But invariably, if you really want to get a, a really good stretch, deep tissue massage and or get someone to stretch you. Who knows what they're doing? Derek, That's I'll tell you, was really good. Derek Farnsworth yeah. is very good, too, at stretch. He stretched me out, man. Oh, boy, did I feel great. And he massages. And he, he does everything all at once. He's got the, the massage gun on you. He's got this, like... This tool that's like it looks like you can a jackhammer. He's putting on you, and uh, he he. When I had my shoulder replacements done, the first one, he stretched that thing out. It felt great after he was done. Now I remember uh, Chris Cedar telling us a story about how Kamal El Garni. I think what he it was either his ankle or his Achilles. He messed up uh, to the point where he was hardly able to walk, yeah, and yeah, there, yeah. There, there was doubt on you know, his ability to compete, but. Derek Farnsworth worked his magic on him. And I think that was 2018 when he came in third behind uh, Flex last, Flex last year and uh, Derek Lunsford. So, yeah, very cool. Shout out, Derek Lunsford. I'm sorry, uh, Derek Farnsworth. Farnsworth. Uh, yeah. Mark Bates. Uh, I mean, he just kind of asked uh, best post-workout. I mean, what was your go-to post-workout meal? You know, it, it, depending on what I what workout. When I would do legs or I do back, I was so nauseous after training from traumatizing my nervous system with the heavy weights I was using that I would, I would really have a lot of trouble eating. So a lot of times I would do my post, I would do post work. I did a post-workout shake before there were post-workout shakes. Back then we would do a Metrex packet, which was about 40 grams of protein. I think it was like 26 grams of carbs and minimal fat. And I would throw an ultra fuel in there, which was a hundred grams of carbs. So just because I couldn't eat and we would, I would have them make it at the gym for me. They would blend it up. And so I was getting 120, almost 130 grams of carbs. I was getting like 40 grams of protein. And that I just, I would sit on that for an hour and a half or so. And then I'd go home and take my time. And then I would cook a meal usually uh, because I wanted to get, I knew I had to get the nutrition in fast. I didn't feel like eating because I was a little queasy still. And, and you can't just wait. You can't just leave the gym and say, oh, I don't feel good. I'm not going to eat now until I feel hungry in, th in three hours because now you've just missed valuable recovery time so my suggestion is a post-workout shake nowadays i recommend all my guys use isolize my isolate whey protein isolate mixed with carbolize which is unflavored which is nice because it kind of takes on the flavor of whatever the protein is and we usually do like 40 grams or 50 grams of carbolize with about 50 grams of protein depending on how big you are and we i'll have them blend that up or they don't need to you can mix it with your finger it makes it so easy and just gulp that down and then in an hour an hour and a half you can have a meal uh, it's, you know, it's really up to you. I know there's people that like to eat food. If you're going to eat food, eat something that's easily digestible. A lot of times when I was dieting for shows and I didn't, wasn't doing many shakes, I would, after the, I would bring my food with me and I'd have like some kind of a white fish, like cod and, and, and rice, or, you know, maybe cod and a piece of avocado with, you know, a baked potato. And, you know, that seemed to get absorbed real easy. Fish digests real easy. And, and, I, and I had no problem with that. Uh, when I was off season, it was a little, it was harder to eat because I wasn't as hungry. When you're dieting, it doesn't matter what you do in the gym, you'll be starving when you're done because that's just, that's just the way it is. And once again, I would like, I would modify what my post workout meal was depending on what I was doing. When I'm not, when I would be off season, the goal would be to get the nutrition in as fast as possible. When I was dieting, I knew I only had a limited amount of meals, so I had to space them out. So I probably would have more than likely have a food meal after the gym to hold me over. Let's go to uh, Bilal Hamide. Even though I'm using PEDs, my body doesn't look pumped when I'm outside of the gym, as opposed to many other bodybuilders who look pumped, especially their arms when they're outside of the gym on a regular basis. Is this just down to genetics or am I missing something here? You know, I think when you say pumped, a lot of people talk about vascularity. I mean, this when I go to the, <laughs> when I go out places, I, I, you know, even when I go, I, yesterday I donated some blood. Um, I felt like it was my civic duty. And I, uh, you know, I, you know, I have a lot of veins, you know, and I am always veiny. It doesn't matter how big or small I am. I have the same veins. 
and people, you know, and I'm very lean and people think I'm always pumped. You know, I'm sure people think I'm taking, you know, cycles of stuff. And cause I look, you know, I look like I'm, I'm a contest bodybuilder. I'm not, obviously not, I'm not big right now, but for the average person, they, they say, Oh shit, he's pumped. And that's because I'm vascular. Now vascularity is twofold. It's, it's definitely genetic. Okay. Cause I've always been this way. My veins are very you know, on the surface and they're big. And the second component is, is how fatty you, you know, the leanness you are. Because when I when I got out of my heart surgery two years ago or a year and a half ago, um, I was you know you hold a tremendous amount of water. I think I was like I looked like I was three hundred pounds, and and you could barely see my veins because I was holding so much fluid in my arms. My arms looked like they were twenty inches, twenty five inches each. But um, so definitely fluid and and fat will obscure you know how you look. So if you're off season and you're walking around, you could be on a ton of gear. You know if you're not a vascular guy by nature. And you hold a little extra body fat, maybe hold some subcutaneous water. You might not look like anything, but then you're the, those are the kind of guys that when you put them on a diet and you put them on low carbs, they drop all that fluid. It's like their body's transforming and they look, you know, jacked out of their mind. Now there are some people, and I hope you're not. I hope this is not your situation. There are some guys I have to who I help and women, and I and I'm just looking at their body week after week, and I'm like, you know, there's something not right here. I said, and then I'll ask him. I'm like, have you tested your gear that you're on with the uh, Roy test kits that I sell at my uh, dayplumbo.com website to see if the stuff is real? Well, I was going to, and then this guy told me, though, they're definitely real. He used them. I said, oh, boy. I said, I think you better buy some of these testers. And they go out and they buy the testers, and sure enough, they're on nothing. You know, They're taking zero. Everything they're taking is fake. So there is that component, too. So you want to make sure your gear is real first, assuming it's real, and that's just something that's happening to you in the offseason. You kind of don't look like you're really on a lot of stuff, maybe because you hold water or maybe you, your body fat level is a little higher or maybe you're just not very vascular. I mean, you have to just deal with that. That's just your body. Everyone has their, you know, their pluses and their minuses. And so it is what it is. But test your gear. I can't – look, I say it all the time. You know, we have testing kits available. It's so easy. They're 20 bucks a piece or something like that. I mean, for peace of mind, because I'd hate to see you guys waste months and months and months of money and and time and and make no progress because of that so always test your gear sarge at arms so i added 25 to 30 mg of injectable anadrol to my pre-workout four times a week and i was expecting the insane pumps but why am i sweating like i'm in a sauna i mean is this a side effect that i've never heard of say that one more time uh, so so he added anadrol a uh, 25 to 30 mg to his pre-workout four times a week and he's sweating uncontrollably is this a side effect that I guess he wasn't aware of. Yeah, it's definitely a side, it's definitely a side effect. The anadrol makes you hold an excessive amount of water, and it makes it raises your blood pressure a lot of times, and it makes you. I don't know what why it makes you sweat. Anabolics that hit you very fast, like test suspension, anadrol, D ball. It's like and trenbolone. You just you can't get cool enough. You can put a fan next to your face, and and, and you're sweating all the time. Um, I used to sleep when I would be on trenbolone. I would sleep with a fan. Overhead blowing, the air conditioning on, and a fan right next to me blowing on me. It, I'd almost have to air, almost air condition myself to, to sleep at night. Um, once I fell asleep, my body would temp cool down. But man, yeah, th those those uh, heavy androgens that hit you quickly can definitely do that, for, without a doubt. Make sure you check your blood pressure too. If it's high, I would just recommend getting off the drug. Um, I'll save this one to the end. Uh, Dan Pena, your thoughts. On Helios, it's in parentheses, says clenbuterol, hydrochloride, yohimbine versus clenbuterol, I guess just clenbuterol, as a fat burner. Also, what dosage is used for Helios when it's 40 mcg per ml? Here's my problem with Helios. It's everything in one in one thing. First of all, I don't like yohimbe. It raises the hormone vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone, which makes it retain fluid. I don't know why I'm burping so much, but I am. Uh, Cause I just ate lunch. Sorry. The thing that I don't like not putting the you know, Himbe aside is that the other stuff is in there in a, in a prescribed dosage. I like to individually tweak clenbuterol, thyroid levels. You know, I like to control them independently. So it, the problem with the, with the, with, when you have a product that has everything in there at once is that if you raise the dose, you're raising everything. And sometimes you don't need to raise everything. You know, sometimes I'll increase clenbuterol, but I won't increase T3. Sometimes I increase T3, I don't increase uh, clenbuterol. So I don't like drugs like that. Plus, you can't test those drugs either and, and see if what you're taking is actually real. 
So my suggestion is to do single drug type preparations. Buy clenbuterol separately, buy T3 separately. You know, if you're going to use Yohimbe, buy that separately so you can control these dosages of what you're putting in your body and, and up them as necessary, not just up everything together. That's like a shotgun approach. And then you don't know what's working and what's not working. You don't know what's causing side effects and what's not causing side effects because there's three drugs in this, in this, in this thing that you can't control the dosages of altogether. So that, that's my two cents. I don't like the drug. I've, I've seen it before. I've, so I've had athletes that used it, had it, and that was all they had. And it, we had a very difficult time uh, adjusting the dose. Question about uh, adjusting, um, I guess, macros or whatever like that in cardio. It's from uh, A. Isa. During prep, how can I know when my KCALs are too low and my cardio is too much? I guess, what are the telltale signs? So, you kill calories, and what was the other thing? No, no, no. K, so I guess it, it, that's kilocalories. Like K cal, so I get kilocalories. So, I guess just yeah. in terms of intake versus cardio being too high. Well, it, it, it's very, you know, I, you're not giving, he's not really giving me too much information here. So the problem is that I don't go by calories. I go by macros. Okay. Cause calories mean nothing. Um, it's all about the macros, how much protein, how much fat, how much carbs you're taking in. Okay. If I see someone's a little bloated looking and they're not losing weight, then I know they're on too many carbs. Okay. Likewise, if their carbs are super low and they're not losing weight and they look kind of full, then I know they're probably eating too much protein. Okay. And I have to lower that a little bit because remember, you can start out at a certain amount of protein. And then if you lose 20, 30 pounds, you don't need as much protein anymore because you're a smaller body, you know, with less, less tissue that needs to repair itself. So you have to you deal with that. Um, I usually use car. I, the last thing I like to change is the diet. If I can tweak cardio a little bit and get more fat loss coming, I usually do that. If I hit a point where I'm giving a lot of cardio and they're just not losing, it means they're eating too much food. Then I have to figure out how what's what's the problem. Is it too much carbs or is it too much protein? Very rarely is it too much fat unless they're unless they're like I sometimes I'll I'll ask people to do food diaries for me and I find out that they're cooking their meals in in, in oil basically. So even though the oil is a good oil like macadamia nut oil, they're they're basically deep frying it in a pan with the stuff and the, the food is absorbing all that oil. So even though it's a healthy oil, the, their fat content is is tripling from what it's supposed to be. So that's too many. That's too many calories. That's of the fat type. So you have to be careful that your macros are not, you know, out of control. And that the only way to do that is by trial and error, and and having a a, a good eye, whether it be your own eye or a coach, who's going to say, you know what, I think you need to cut your carbs back. That comes with experience. It's hard to teach someone that. But like I said, if I see someone who's a little bloaty, I and they're eating a decent amount of carbs, I cut that back first. The carbs are already cut back and they're still looking a little full. And I'm like, and I know they're not cheating. I'll, I'll lower their protein a little bit. Um, if I think they're, they're, they're eating the right amount of macros, but they're not losing, I'll increase their cardio. And that's how I do it. And that, like I said, that comes with experience. Also, if you want to, if you're not sure and you want to learn how to do this process, I have a course, Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru. And you don't have to wait till the new one. You can go and watch the old one. It, I, we, we tape every single course. It's got a great interface. You can go through my DavePalomo.com website, go on there. The, each course is eight hours long, and sometimes they're about nine hours, and you can watch it at your leisure. If you sign up for it, I'll send you the book separately in the PDF format, and I, it's a great value, a great way to learn all this information. Take a couple of questions for men that are past the age of 40. From uh, raw, First one is from uh, Raw Muscle Glutes. What anabolics would you avoid for a 40 plus year old? Which ones would you definitely not do or tell a 40 plus year old to do? Now, I guess my question to that is, is, is 40 sort of the water, the watermark or is, would you maybe bump it up a few more years before you give those kind of uh, suggestions as far as what yeah. not to take? The, I got two answers to the question. What would I do? And what would, what would, how would I advise other people? Because they're two different answers because I always said, when I was competing, I was told, well, any, ask any of my friends that were around me at the time. I said, if I'm still competing at 40, put a bullet in my head. I said, because that I've lost my mind, that means. Because I knew that my body can only take so much. And that I, I, it, I, if I can't, couldn't have found someone, th something else to give me pleasure by the age of 40, I, I knew that I was on the wrong path in my life. That has nothing to do with anyone else. So I would not be taking anything at 40, you know, aside from hormone replacement. Having said that, I do know people that started late. And that, or that are just super passionate about their bodybuilding. They're very close. Some of them just turned pro. 
They're on the cusp of turning pro. They still want to make a career out of it. That's their passion. In, that, in those cases, I try to explain to people that are you know older than 40, 45, 50, you really shouldn't be using toxic substances at this point. Because when you're younger, you can kind of get away with it. Your body is, is, is resilient. But I wouldn't be taking any kind of heavy orals like a Dianabol or, or, or you know, maybe small dose of Dianabol, but certainly not Anadrol. Um, I would really be wary of Trembolone. I wouldn't be doing high dosages of it. I see some of these guys doing 800 milligrams a week. I'm like, you guys are nuts. You know, maximum should be about 50, 150 milligrams per week. You know, and you got to watch, you got to watch your vitals. You got to check your blood pressure, your, your fasting blood sugars, because as when you hit 40, that's when stuff starts going wrong. That's when stuff starts, stops working as well. Your blood vessels lose their elasticity. Your blood pressure goes up, which can stress the kidneys out more. Your blood sugars sometimes can start creeping up the fasting blood sugars in the morning. So you got to keep an eye on all this stuff if you're going to do the drugs, you know, and you got to give yourself off time. When you get a little older, your body needs more recovery time and it needs more time to detoxify itself in the off season. So after you don't eat your show, you got to clean out for eight to 10 weeks and, and that you have to, if you want to continue doing it at a, at a high level, but I certainly would stay away from like Anadrol. Uh, I, I wouldn't be taking, you know, excessive amounts of Trembolone, especially if, if you notice your blood pressure going up. So there's some, there's, you know, I wouldn't be taking excessive amounts of GH, which could raise your blood pressure as well. You got to just be smart and check your vitals more. Go for your diagnostic testing. Get your echocardiogram and your cardiac CT scan of your heart. Make sure you don't have any blockages. And, you know, if you if you got a clean bill of health and everything looks good, you can do it. But you got to do it in spurts, you know cycles that's what we call it cycling you do a cycle you come off do a cycle you come off and i think that as you get older if you're going to continue to do it into older age you have to be a little bit more diligent about what you're doing you can't be as reckless second uh question from men that are over the age of 40 one from uh one slope pst i'm 43 i had both shoulders replaced within the past year the left one is feeling great post five months but the right one post one year is still bothering me i decided to take 100 mg a week of DECA to help. I'm now on 150 mg a week of TRT. Should I increase the amount of test I'm taking or will I be fine? Also, am I okay taking 100 mg a week for three months? Yeah, I mean, you didn't describe it that you were having any problems. So you obviously weren't having, when you take low dose DECA, you really don't get any erectile issues with, with that, which is good. And the funny thing is you can take 100 milligrams a week of DECA and you can actually get the anti-inflammatory effects of it, which is really nice as well. And you'll get a little anabolic boost from it. That's the advantage of doing that. So stay low dose. There's no toxicity to DECA. As long as your blood pressure is under control, um, there's no, I think there's no negatives to taking 100 milligrams of testosterone a week and 100 milligrams of DECA a week or, or you know, in the, whatever dosage you take can seem pretty fine as well. For three months, I don't think you're going to have a problem with it. And hopefully, You'll clear up the, the shoulder inflammation and everything will come back to normal. Sometimes these shoulder replacements can take a good two years before they really feel solid. And usually it's because the rotator cuff, in other words, the joint's fine because they replaced it, but the rotator cuff can be a little weak and a little wobbly. So rather than trying to push too heavy, really work to strengthen that cuff so that the, the joint gets tight. And once it gets tight, the pain will go away. I did uh, want to get a quick thought on you, and I'm pretty sure you're going to do a full-length uh, preview video for the Vancouver Pro, but the competitor list is out, so I just want to get a quick uh, reaction from you as you take a look at the list right here. Uh, I guess the most recognizable names, Beef Stew competing now in his yeah. third show, uh, Canada's Robin Strand, Stan DeLongu uh, yeah. making his season debut, Tim Budisham, I believe this is also his third show, and John Jewett. I think this is his second appearance of the yeah. season. I think it's going to be between uh, Beef Stew and uh, John Jewett. I really, th I, I really think we're going to see those guys top two in this lineup. And uh, that's not taking anything away from the other guys. I just think that they're they're a little their conditioning level is like in another stratosphere above the rest of these guys. And don't be surprised if they're the last two guys standing on stage there. And so, uh, which is great because one of those guys is going to probably go to the Olympia, which is super. I know Stew's been. Uh, actually, I think Stu made a very good decision to skip a couple of the shows that we just saw because they were very competitive. Now he's going in here, and I think he has an absolute chance to win this thing, and that's got to be super motivating for him. So I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. We'll take uh, one more question. Uh, this question is about you. Uh, 
what do you feel was your best look ever and your worst ever look? And then I guess he also <laughs> adds, if you could also uh, interview Charles Claremont, you've gotten Lou Ferrigno before yeah. uh, many times, as a matter yeah. of fact, but uh, that's something you would request. So your best look, worst look to date. Best look on stage was probably 93, uh, 2003, excuse me, um, USA. I placed second in the heavyweight, uh, super heavyweight class behind Chris Cook. I thought that was probably my most polished look. Fullness was great, you know, coloring, you know, every, everything kind of, I was dry. That was, that was really should have been, you know, I think my pro card victory. I was second the, the, the year before to Tony Freeman, and I looked really good at that show too in Texas at the Nationals, but I think I was better in 90, in, in 03. And um, my worst look, I, you know, there was, what was the show? There was one show I did in 04 and I, someone talked me into not doing a diuretic for that show. And that was my last show I competed. And I, and I didn't do it. It was, I think it was the USA and I just didn't use a diuretic and I just didn't have that crispness. Um, and it, I was pissed off that I didn't, you know, that I listened to the person, but, um, and that's when I said, you know what, I, 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 that's it. I'm done. You know? So it's, uh, I would say that was probably my, it wasn't my worst look, but it was, it was my most disappointing look. There were looks that I wasn't thrilled with, you know, in like maybe late nineties, you know, early two thousands. I wasn't like, well, I, maybe I was, I kind of lost like motivation for a little bit while because they weren't placing me well. Maybe I was trying to come in too big. And then I realized my better looks were a little lighter, like 265. Um, I was trying to come in like 270, you know, and, and 272. And, and I looked big and hard. I just, you know, I wasn't as aesthetic, I guess. And, Probably the best look I've ever had was, I believe it was in, oh, I want to say, I don't even, it was, I think it was 90, uh, no, it might've been like 99, 2000. I did a guest posing in Erie PA. It was like maybe two weeks after the USA or Nationals or whatever. I don't remember which show it was. And for some reason, my rebound off that show was insane. And I remember getting, Gary Unit very rarely gives compliments to anyone. And, and I guess most of the show, it was Gary's show. Gary came up to me after he said, man, if you look like this on stage, you, you'd be a pro. He goes, this was the best look I'd ever seen of you. I was, I was full and round and dense. And I didn't even, I, I, I didn't take a diuretic. You know, I was just guest posing. And I don't know why everything just fired perfectly. If I could have <laughs> duplicated that look, that would have been the, the look I needed. But sometimes, you know, you just get lucky. And uh, I wish I had pictures from that guest posing because I really did look good at that show. But the best on stage, I would say, would be 03 USA. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Reminder right now on the channel, all new episode of After Hours, which featured the return of Jimmy the Bull. So a lot of hilarity there. Um, all new episode of Heavy Muscle Radio. I'm trying to, oh yeah, Portugal. Portugal. That was the Mr. Big Evolution Pro this past weekend. I kept mixing it up with the Big Man Weekend Pro, which is, <laughs> I guess, an Alicante, Spain. So a few of the, our European friends yeah. were sure to remind us. Yeah. But again, Chris Cicito, Dave Palumbo doing a full uh, recap of, um, of the Portugal pro of the Mr. Big Evolution pro, which of course saw Nathan Diasha win and qualify for the Olympia. And hopefully we will see him there uh, in October, um, you know, to be on stage and compete against some of the best in the world. I don't know. We know it's been a struggle for him over the last few years. So It'll be great to see truly one of bodybuilders, I guess, if you want to say over the last decade, maybe a top 15, top 20, I mean, say top 15, really, if you think about it, bodybuilder uh, amongst the crop, or whatever, and taking out, you know, a really good William Bonac in the process. You could, you could argue maybe top 10, you know, over the course of the last decade or so, you say for the Mr. Olympia winners. So again, a good account. Monumental, really, uh, for Nathan Diesh. Again, I believe this is going to be his fifth Olympia qualification. Um, so it'll be great to see him on stage this year in October in Las Vegas. If you haven't already done so, subscribe below. Hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our show segments, anything and everything that we have coming up. Of course, now we're in the thick of the conference of the uh, conference season. We're talking basketball now of the contest season. Uh, Vancouver Pro this week. Chicago the week after, Dubai Pro the week after that, Tampa the week after that, and I believe Texas either the week after or maybe two weeks after that. So you are going to have a stretch of some of the most competitive open class shows, more Olympia tickets to be punched, and of course, for our channel, a lot more analysis segments and a lot more content for you to consume. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.